Hello everybody, welcome to this episode of your Art of the Theatre lectures at home with Jay Flom. I'm your host, Jay Flom. Uh, as we enter week 14 of our quarantine lockdown, today we are going to talk about a subject that's very near and dear to my heart. The subject is directors. Uh, I love directing. It's something that I've been doing for many, many years. It's something that I feel like I'm quite adept at, and what I want to do today is just share a little bit with you about that process and give you a little insight behind the curtain at what goes on with directors and what we do. So before we jump in, I want to show you a quick video, uh, some professional directors talking about what they do, and then we'll pick up from there. See you on the other side. I guess I would like to start, if you don't mind, by, by getting your thoughts on <coughs> what a director does. <laughs> Thea. It's fascinating to me how the job has changed and how the answer to that question is different. But in essence, you are, I guess you're the captain of the ship and um, <clears throat> you have to lead a team of people. Um, you have to, in many ways, you have many different hats, so you also become a parent. Yes. So Diplomacy is, is a very is big. <laughs> is big. Kofi Annan is a huge uh, <laughs> idol of mine. <laughs> and Arsene Wenger is my other one, so oh, that's wow. the other thing. On opening night, you've been the most important person in the project. You are the leader, you are the director, you have to make all the judgment calls. You are the one people, everybody goes to. At the, in the last two weeks, if we're completely honest, when you direct a big opera, I'm sure with film as well, you know, it feels even a bit as if you're God. You know, you, you sit in the auditorium, you have a huge desk, lots of assistants and people around you. You can say, stop, bring on the car. You know, you, can tr you, you create a world. You're sometimes a slightly frustrated God, but still, you feel very powerful. Yeah. And then on opening night, you have to let it all go. And, and, and although you go backstage and you say, oh, you know, good luck, and please remember in the second act to turn around, you know, basically they want you to go away. You are very, very powerful, and ultimately you can do nothing. Does the bigger the production, David, mean that you have more to control or less to control? Actually, oddly, I think the bigger the production, it's all about the key people you work with. Yeah. So even though there may be hundreds of people involved, as long as you're working closely with some of those key creatives, your production designer, your composer, obviously the, the actors, then you get maximum, I mean, I think one of the things you have to do as a director is you really need to focus in on what will have the maximum impact in a production, because there are so many things that you have to concentrate on, so many relationships you have to manage. It's about choosing where to put your time, mm -hmm. which is always quite stretched and challenged, and where you're gonna put your focus. And I think deciding what's gonna really make a big difference to the end result and what isn't is <laughs> crucial. But I always like, um, f my, my philosophy is about empowerment, ultimately. It's about that huge group of people that you're working with across a whole spectrum, you know, from DOPs to operators, even the grip or the sound designer or your producer or the exec at the studio. Ultimately, it is about finding the right pattern of a relationship that will guide through what you want from the process to end up with the best film. And it's... It is managing relationships, and every single relationship, as you say, is fundamentally different. And so... Um, and imagine every day is different, isn't it? Mm. Because it's not like you have a... Well, tell me if I'm wrong, but it's not like you have a... Like a, the day... I know you obviously have a shooting schedule and things like that, but you never quite know what's going to happen, I guess, in a way as well. Or is it, is it kind of... Pla yeah. Or is it kind of planned to... When you're actually shooting something, it's fairly rigorously planned. But within that structure, you know, lots of things can go wrong. Actually, filmmaking is a process of fixing problems, yeah. <laughs> frankly, often, because there are so many things that can surprise you and take you, of course, a wee bit. And it's how you manage that and it's how, how you use those things that go wrong sometimes that gets you to a really fun and interesting place. But, I mean, simply because certainly the, even, even the smaller bits of television I used to do, it, it is rigorously organised simply because of the amount of money that we burn mm. through in a single day. Yeah. You know, a, a single day shoot on the bigger films I make is hundreds of thousands of dollars. So you ought to, it has to be organised. Otherwise, people get really frustrated that you're wasting stuff. Yeah. On the other end, um, one of the other things that I would always say you, one has to be as a, as a 
director is a facilitator almost so but particularly when you're doing new work in the theater um, so you have your actors on the one hand and you have your playwright on the other and in one sense you are the least important person in the room because at the the playwright for me is the most important person <clears throat> And the actors, at the end of the day, are going to be saying the writer's words. And you, just as Casper says, you can't be there. Mm -hmm. They have to be able to do it by themselves. Equally, the playwright won't be there, but their words will be with them. Yeah. And you are the person who has to guide those two things to, to be as magical as possible. Um, and in some ways, that's when you sort of you lose your power in a funny way. Although that choice is, says a lot, I think, about directors, because there are certain directors who would never see themselves like that. For them, it's about being God from start to finish. Yeah. Uh, and it's about their vision, and that's the most important thing. <clears throat> so if they want to do a production of uh, Measure for Measure, they want to do it in a way that no one's ever done it before, and they don't care if it doesn't make sense necessarily because it wants to have a stamp on it, and that's the most important thing. in that video as to what directors do and I want to highlight a couple of things and, and share my own point of view of it. First of all, I like to think of the term the buck stops here when it comes to directors. Right? We don't necessarily make all of the decisions that happen on stage. Obviously actors are making choices, designers are making choices, producers are making choices, but ultimately the buck stops here. Meaning if I'm the director and a designer puts on uh, some clothes that clash with the scenery, even though that was on the designer's poor communication, the buck stops here. I'm responsible for talking to those people and getting that straight. If the actors make some horrible choices, the buck stops here, that's on me. I saw uh, recently, I was watching a production of a musical that I love very much called She Loves Me, uh, and they had recorded uh, the recent Broadway revival for it and posted it up online so that the public could watch it. And this is a show I love, filled with actors who are at the top of their game. And those actors were making terrible choices in this production. Everything was over the top, and they had taken a show that I think is very sincere and honest and turned it into a sort of hammy, shticky thing. Well, the buck stops with the director, and I blame the director for making those kind of decisions. And maybe some people saw it and they loved it. For me, it was not what I was... It's not the way I envisioned that show. So... Ultimately, the director is responsible. The buck stops here. The director is also in charge of sort of keeping the wheels turning, if you will. So when I'm directing a show, uh, usually once or twice a week, I'll stop into the costume shop and just see how things are going. I'll stop into the scene shop and see how the build is going and how the scenery is looking. I try to involve myself at least tangentially in every aspect of the show, and again, just to make sure that the wheels are turning. And what I loved in that video that I showed you is that they refer to the director as the captain of a ship. Because really, that's what you are. You are the ship's captain. You're responsible for seeing uh, an entire fleet of people through the process. Now, I want to take a moment to, to explain, and, and in full disclosure to you, the directing process is slightly different uh, in theater than it is on film and, and on television. And at the end of this lecture, I'm going to get a little bit more into detail about the distinctions, but just know that this particular conversation, because this is an art of the theater class, not an art of the cinema class, we're really going to focus on stage directing. And there is a lot of crossover, don't get me wrong, but there are things that we're going to talk about that are very unique to stage. One thing that is true across the board in any media is that a director must be a master storyteller. You have to know what the story is you're telling, and you have to help communicate that story to the audience. And that's the key word of it all, communication. If, if I had to summarize what a director does down to only one word, the most important thing and the thing that I want you to take away most from all of this is that the director is a communicator. 
Who does the director communicate with? Well, let's start with the obvious. The communication begins between the playwright and the director. Sometimes that's a literal communication. Sometimes the playwright is contemporary and alive, and the director has the good fortune of working with the playwright, where the communication is a literal back-and-forth dialogue. I've had that before when I was living in New York. I've directed a few plays uh, over the years throughout my career that, uh, that I got to work with the, direct, uh, with the playwright. Sometimes that was very exciting, other times that was very distracting and irritating. But even if I'm directing a piece of Shakespeare, for example, and Shakespeare's long dead, we know that. You do know that, right? Shakespeare's dead. Sorry, spoiler alert. Um, but yes, even when the playwright uh, is dead, or when it's a playwright who's written a play and published it, and, and even though they're alive, maybe I'm, I'm picking it up and directing it in a theater in a different town, in a different place, I might not have a direct, literal communication with the playwright, but their words, their blueprint that they've provided, is, is something uh, with which I need to communicate. Uh, I then have to take that communication to the actors and help them understand the link between the playwright's words and their portrayal of the characters, and then ultimately we are communicating with the audience. And so I, I, my directing grad school professor used to show us this uh, director's triangle to remind us that the director is at the center of this great communication between playwright, actors, and audience. I would also throw in that, of course, the director has to be a great communicator with the design team and with the stage management team and with the producers, right? The director's job is essentially to communicate. And weekly, during the process of a, of, of a theater production, we have what we call production meetings where everybody gets in a room together and the stage manager calls us to order and says, okay, let's start with the director. And the director is supposed to give a report and talk about where we are in the process and what's going on in the rehearsals. And then we go around the table and everybody else at the table communicates what they're doing in their department. And really what they're doing is presenting it specifically for the director to say, yes, that's great, or no, let's go in a different direction. So that communication the idea of being a good diplomat, uh, diplomacy is a really important skill. You don't just want to tell your, your collaborators that you think their ideas are rotten. Uh, so communication in a tactful way is really important, but that's really the fundamental underlying foundation of what a director does. Some people also consider a director similar to a teacher, and that also rings near and dear and true to me. I, I teach for a living, but I also direct for a living, and it's hard for me to separate the two. When I'm working in rehearsals with actors, I'm very often in a teaching position, teaching them, helping them understand the character, helping them understand the relationships uh, between other characters, helping them understand how a particular action or a choice they make uh, uh, affects the rest of the characters or affects the storytelling. Now, let's take a moment and uh, back up and give you a little bit of history of directing as a career or as a position. Because you'll remember when we talked about Shakespeare's day, there were no directors, right? The playwright, Shakespeare, was in essence the director. He would show up with pages of the script or with the entire script and he would say to the cast, all right, here's how it's going to go. You stand there, you do this. Uh, and so very often the playwright would sort of take on the role of directing the play. Sometimes it was the star of a play. If you were a very, very famous person and you were hired and the play was written specifically for you, you might be the one to tell everybody where to stand and how to say their lines. Um, but the actual position of a director begins with a man named George II, and he was the Duke of Saxe-Meiningen. This was a, a province or a region in Germany. Uh, those are his dates. You don't really need to remember those, but just to give you context, as usual, 1826 to 1914 is when George II lived. Uh, and in Germany, he established his own court theater group. And by court theater group, obviously that means this was a group of, of performers that were playing plays specifically for the royals at the time. Uh, George II, Duke of Saxe-Meiningen, was both a director and a designer, and we credit him as the first modern director because he was really the first person to say, I'm not the playwright, I'm not one of the actors, I'm going to come in and I'm going to tell you all how we're going to do this play. So George II, Duke of Saxe-Meiningen, in the mid to late 1800s, sort of established this idea of director. Now, the idea of a play happening without a director is almost unheard of. Right? It's virtually absurd, and uh, a director is such a huge part of the process. So, now let's answer the question, what does a director actually do? A director 
first and foremost oversees all aspects of the production. And again, I come back to this phrase, the buck stops here, right? I might not be the person responsible for choosing what costumes they wear, but the buck stops here because the costume designer is gonna show me all of the costumes and ask me what I think and ask me for my opinion. I ultimately have to say yes, no, yes, no. Uh, the scenic designer is going to say, I think it should look like this. And ultimately it's my job to say, I think that really works, or I'm not sure that's telling our story, right? The buck stops here. I oversee all aspects of the production as a director. The director interprets the playwright's text and determines the uh, m probably most important fundamental question, which is, what is the story we are telling, right? And this is where we can see different productions of the same play in the hands of different directors and have a very different experience. I'll go back to the example that I used a little bit earlier of the musical She Loves Me. The version that I did was night and day compared to the version that is on Broadway HD that you can view online now. Uh, obviously, I saw the story as very different than Scott Ellis, the director of that production, and there, therefore you get two very different productions. But ultimately, the one thing I'll give Scott Ellis credit for, even though I hated the way he coached the actors to be over the top, I'll give him credit, he was very consistent. He made a choice that the story was whimsical and silly and quirky and it was meant to sort of yuck, yuck, yuck for the audience, and he stayed with that. And I'm willing to bet that those actors who were in that production, who I know are phenomenal, gifted actors, I'm willing to bet that sometimes he coached them to be a little bit bigger than they were maybe uh, maybe instinctually choosing to be. And he did that because he decided what the story was and he wanted to keep that consistent. So I give him credit for that, even though I think his production sucked. Um, since we're just uh, getting through reading and discussing Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, I found this clip that I thought uh, ties in really nicely to both our discussion on Cat on a Hot Tin Roof and our discussion on directors. So I'm going to roll a clip for you and let you see a little interview and a little montage of clips from the most recent Broadway production of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, which starred uh, Felicia Rashad as Big Mama and James Earl Jones as Big Daddy, among some other big celebrities, uh, and it was directed by uh, Debbie Allen, who's a famous director and choreographer. And what's unique and interesting and exciting about this production of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, as you'll see, obviously, it's an all-black cast. Um, and so take a look at them talking about Cat on a Hot Tin Roof and this production and what the story was. This is our first day of rehearsal, and I'm just tremendously excited to, you know, be at the helm of this ship as we navigate through these torrential family waters and rediscover this classic material that is by nature so relevant today. The theme of this entire piece is mendacity and we all know what that means. You know, what is truth? Who is telling the truth? Do we want to know the truth? Can we recognize the truth? Mostly it's about life and being uh, in, a, in a state of discontent. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we've all had those times. Rick. <laughs> Maggie. Yeah. Big Mama. Big Daddy. Hi, this is Terrence Howard. Hi, I'm Anika Noni Rose. Hi, I'm James Earl Jones. I'm Felicia Bichard inviting you to join us at the Broadhurst Theater for Academy Hot Ten. So again, the director's job is to figure out and get everybody on board with what is the story we're telling. The next thing a director is required to do is determine the methods or the conventions that are going to be used. Sometimes the script lays out very detailed for us what kind of conventions or what kind of way the story should be told, but very often the director has room to interpret. And before I say any more about this, I want to show you another clip from a recent Broadway hit play called Indecent. And just a little bit about, about Indecent, uh, it is a true story. It is based on an event that happened uh, way back in the early 1900s. A Yiddish playwright, that Yiddish was uh, a language spoken by Jews in Eastern Europe, particularly, specifically in Poland. Uh, a Yiddish playwright wrote a piece of theater that was very provocative and very controversial, and it had to do with a lesbian relationship. 
and he put it on stage in Europe and it caught lots of controversy, but it also became a very popular hit. And eventually they brought that play to America, to the Lower East Side in New York where Jewish immigrants were centered, and they performed the play there, first in Yiddish, again a big hit, although controversial, and ultimately they moved it uptown to what would now be considered Broadway, and they translated it and did it in English, and it caused such a riot that all of the actors were arrested for being indecent on stage because they had women kissing and they talked about things that were not particularly savory to the Jewish uh, people. Here is a little clip, a little trailer, if you will, from the play Indecent, and on the flip side of it, we're going to talk about conceptually what you saw. Take a look. We have a story we want to tell you about a play, a play that changed my life. have the opportunity and you're bored and sitting at home, I highly, highly, highly encourage you to see if you can track down the full production of Indecent. There is a website called Broadway HD, just for your information, that is a monthly subscription website. I think it's $10 a month and they're actually offering, uh, during the quarantine, uh, Corona quarantine, they're offering a free first month. So if you want to check it out, you can see a lot of Broadway shows, musicals and plays. Uh, for free, streaming on there, and Indecent is one of them. It is magnificent. Now, I want to ask you if you recognized from that clip any elements of epic theater. You might have noticed that the characters were breaking the fourth wall. There is a stage manager character who narrates the story. You might have noticed that the characters were playing instruments on stage. Uh, you might not have caught this in the clips, but uh, there were uh, super titles behind them. Sometimes they would project something in Hebrew lettering that would then translate into English. Uh, all sorts of aspects of epic theater. So if you, again, if you want to see an example of modern epic theater styled in the, in the vein of Bertolt Brecht, Indecent is a great piece to look at. One of the things that's fascinating is at the very beginning of the play, when you walk into the theater, all the actors are sitting on stage. And you walk in and they're all just seated there in, in suits and coats staring out. And this was a directorial choice. When the play begins, they all stand up and they uh, let their arms down and a bunch of sand pours out of their sleeves. Again, a directorial choice. And you think, wow, that's really interesting. And they start to move and sand is going all over the stage, pouring out from their sleeves. Well, what you come to find out, uh, and I'm getting chills even thinking about this, is at the end of the play, the time period winds up right at the time where the Nazis are coming to power. And of course there is a metaphor of all of these people literally returning to dust uh, in, in, the, in the, the heels of the Nazi incineration of six million Jews. And so the play is sort of a metaphor for that. And the director has made a conceptual choice to begin the play with everyone on stage and to have that sand flow from their sleeves. Um, this is an example of a director interpreting a play and applying a convention. That's part of what a director does. And then, ultimately, a director has to communicate to the design and production team and all the actors and just keep everybody on the same page. So, for example, if I said, we're going to do this production and we're going to do it in an epic theater way, and the designer came to me and showed me the design and it was a very realistic uh, living room, then I could say, well, that's a really beautiful set you've designed, but it's not the story we're telling, right? We've decided we were going to do this in a very epic theater way, so I want to see 
the back wall of the theater. I want to put the band or the orchestra on stage. I would love you to have um, a projection behind the actors where they can project super titles or subtitles, right? That is the director trying to keep everybody on the same page and trying to remind everybody of what is the story we're telling. Next thing a director does is he or she or they organize the entire rehearsal process and lead the play all the way up to opening night. So if I'm a good director, I'm organized, I have discussed with the stage manager, this is the rehearsal schedule, this is what we're going to do on each given day, these are the actors I need to be ready at 7 o'clock to do this scene, and then call these two actors to join us at 8 o'clock to rehearse this scene. The better organized I can be, the, the better experience the actors are going to have, and the more respect they're going to have for me. So my job, part of my job, is to uh, organize the entire rehearsal process. Now here's the kicker. You may or may not know this. But when a play opens, the director's job is done. And so often, maybe one of the most common questions people ask me is they'll see me on opening night at the theater of, of a play that I've directed, and they'll say, are you nervous? And in most cases I say, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm eager. I'm excited. Uh, or they'll say, you know, what's next? What, what's going to happen next? And I say, I don't know. The play is now theirs. Right before the show opens, I usually like to get the actors together and thank them for their work. I like to remind them that for the length of the run of the play, whether that's three days or three weeks or three months, that their job is to maintain the integrity and the consistent performances that we set. But ultimately, my job is done when the play opens. So who's in charge? The stage manager. A good stage manager knows a lot about directing, knows a lot about coaching actors and working with actors because part of their job after the director leaves and goes on to his or her next gig, their job is to hang on and maintain the integrity of the show. So a good stage manager will give actors notes throughout the run. And those notes might be, you know, oh, you, you stood to the left and you missed your light. Can you make sure you hit that cue because I've got the light on you? Or you know, they might tell an actor, you're forgetting a line, or you're saying the line wrong, and that line is a really important cue for me to, to hit the next light cue, so I really need you to make sure you review your script. Or if actors start in a comedy, for instance, very often actors will start to embellish a little bit during the, the run of a show uh, and try and go for laughs, and a stage manager, part of their job is to rein that actor in and say, hey, that's not the way the director wanted it. But the crazy thing of all of this, you guys, is that once the show opens, the director's job is done. Let's talk a little bit about the actual director's process. Very similar to what we talked about with designers, it's a 3R kind of a setup. The first one being read, read, read. I read the play so many times, and again, I've told you this before when it came to designers, I let the play work on me before I work on the play. So sometimes I'll read a play three or four times before I make any sort of decisions about it. And then I dive into research, and I do tons of research. That's really one of my favorite parts of the whole directorial process. That research can be anywhere from a couple of weeks to several months, tons and tons of research. And then, in lieu of uh, what we had used as our third R, if you remember with designers, we said read, research, render. I hope you remembered that. Uh, I'm going to assume that there was a chorus of people shouting out render. Instead of render, because I'm not actually drawing or sketching as a director, I use the third R to be respond. So I read the play a lot, I research the play a lot, and then I begin to respond to the play. And those responses could take several different forms. For instance, I, I think I've talked to you about a stream of consciousness. So I might read a play and then just sit down with a piece of paper and write down any stream of consciousness thoughts that the play evokes for me. That could be colors, that could be songs that, that it makes me think of, that could be images, that could be ideas. Um, I just make a stream of consciousness list of what the play does to me, what it makes me think of, and then I set that aside. Then I begin to talk to my team my other designers, right, the production team, and I start to say, what do you think is the story? What excites you about the play? What, what, what are you sort of latching on to? Uh, and what we do in a collaboration is we solidify and clarify the design concept, and the elements of the play begin to kind of come together, and then I can start to envision the play on stage. And on stage is a key part of this. I have to remember that my medium is limited, right? I'm not directing films, so I can't cut away and I can't do all sorts of special effects. I have to envision how can I tell this story on stage in a way that lets the audience suspend disbelief 
uh, and go for this ride with me. And then my next part of the process is working with the stage manager to organize the process from the audition to the opening day. And as I said, that could be anywhere from four to six weeks on average. Uh, some cultures do rehearsal processes up to eight or nine weeks. Uh, and in America, we have this grand tradition in the summers called summer stock theater, where, uh, where performers are hired for, you know, a th three to 12 week stretch of time. And they may be producing anywhere from one to five or six or seven different shows in that time. So I've actually pr uh, directed entire full-length musicals in six days. I think that's my record. Six days is the quickest to get a show up on its feet. And boy, is it stressful and exciting. Um, so one week on the short end, eight weeks on the generous end. But generally speaking, in this country, we tend to be in the five to six week uh, range for rehearsal. Talking about directors' processes in the room with actors, we sort of have a spectrum. On the one end, you have the director that is very loose and open and walks in and says, all right, get up and, and do the scene and show me something and, and I'll respond to it. And, and so the actors will kind of get up and go, okay, and they'll read a scene and they'll make some choices and the director will go, yeah, that's, that was good. Let, let's do it again. Just do something different. These directors tend to frustrate the hell out of actors because as an actor, you kind of want to go, Give me some direction, tell me what to do. So on one end of the spectrum, you have the sort of loose, hippy-dippy director who comes in and shows up and, and just goes on instinct. On the opposite end of the spectrum, you have the director who is the dictator, or the auteur, if you will, who wants to control everything. And I've seen directors do this, where they will literally place an actor and go, yeah, you're going to stand here, and I want you to look at her, and I want you to point on that line. No, not, not when you say, go away. I want you to point after you say, go away. Go away. Do it like that. And sometimes these directors will literally tell the actors how to say the lines. That also drives actors mental. Because you kind of go, look, let me, let me be creative. Let me be an artist. Let me interpret. In my opinion, the best directors, and of course this would be my opinion because this is how I work. In my opinion, the best directors are prepared. Prepared, 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 but also open to collaboration. I want to show you example, uh, an example of what I'm talking about. Here's an image of my directing book. This is sort of my Bible when I work on a show. And this was from a show that I did last semester at Slippery Rock called Dogfight. And as you can see, hopefully, in the image, uh, I have my script with the dialogue on one page, and then I always have a blank page opposite that. And that, what that allows me to do is to notate. So I have a certain shorthand. If I wanted to say that the character Birdlace crosses stage left, that might be the letter B in a circle, and that's my notation for Birdlace. The letter X, which means crosses, and then SL, Birdlace crosses stage left. And you can see that I'll notate that in my script. Uh, another thing that I tend to do a lot is I tend to use um, the floor plan or the layout. You remember, hopefully, the floor plan is the bird's eye view uh, drawn to scale that the scenic designer gives me. So once I have my floor plan from the scenic designer, I will often make a shit ton of photocopies and insert them into my script so that I can, uh, especially when I'm doing musical numbers and I'm choreographing and creating lots of movement on stage and patterns, I can use that floor plan to notate it. Now, I'm not rigid with any of that. These are preparations and these are guidelines for me, but ultimately when I come into rehearsal with the actors, I have to be willing to let it go and to let them be creative. And so usually my process and the process that I recommend to directors is a sort of hybrid between preparation and having a specific idea and then letting the actors do their work. And hopefully you create an environment of collaboration. Speaking of the actors, you may not know this as well, but the actors are actually added very, very late into the process. So I've read the play for several months and done research, and the design team and I have gotten together and we've talked, and if I'm doing this at a professional level, I've probably met with the producers. We've probably hired what's called a casting director. That's a person whose job is basically being a gatekeeper, uh, and they're screening lots and lots of actors. Uh, if, if for example, I was directing a show on Broadway, and it's a popular musical, and everybody wants to audition for it. Um, we might see upwards of a thousand people come to an audition. The director is not usually involved on the first level of auditions. Usually the director hires a casting director 
whose job is to screen through a bunch of people. Sometimes those screenings are on video, other times they're live. But essentially, the director will communicate his or her vision to the casting director, the casting director will go out in search of talent, and then they'll cull that list down to a manageable number of people, and then we'll bring in actors to audition. Now for stage shows, that audition can be, if, if it's a musical, it's always going to involve singing. If it's a straight play, a non-musical play, uh, that will sometimes involve a monologue where the actor has prepared material that they deliver. Other times it will be what we call sides, or a reading, which is where they're given a couple of pages from the actual script and said, here you go, we want you to read the character of Dorothy. And that actor will go home and prepare and try to memorize and learn a bit of the script. But the audition process happens really late in the game in terms of the timeline. And the casting process is exciting and frightening. I always tell actors, as nervous as you are to audition, I promise you, as the director, I'm more nervous because if you don't get this job, you can go to six other auditions this week and have other options. But if I don't find the right people for my show, I'm screwed, right? Because the buck stops here. So I gotta find the best actors. Once I have my cast, we generally move into a phase we call table work. That could be one or two rehearsals, or in some productions where the play is really thick and intellectual, sometimes table work can last a week or more. But table work is just what it sounds like. We sit around a table and we talk about the play. We'll read it together. We'll, we'll talk about what, what it evokes for us. We'll talk about what we think of the relationships between the characters. And we'll start making choices at the table before we get up on our feet. Then we get on our feet and we call this period of time blocking or staging, right? If, if we talk about blocking, that goes back to that diagram I showed you where I had shown you my script and it has lists of where the actors are going. So blocking is literally telling the actors where to stand. Here's a little bit of trivia for you. Why is it called blocking? Because early on, some director sat down with a diagram of the stage and used little blocks, literally little like ch children's blocks, like Legos kind of things, uh, to represent the characters and move them around the stage. And so eventually we just came to know staging as blocking. Once we've blocked the show, and that means the actors all know where they're going and where they're standing, we've sort of sketched it out, we go into what we call run-throughs, which means we're running uh, either big chunks of the play or the entire play, uh, for feedback from the director and coaching of the acting. And then we get into the late process, which includes what we call technical rehearsals or tech rehearsals. In tech rehearsal, that's where we add lights and sound, uh, and usually the actors move on the stage for the first time, so they're interacting with the scenery, under lights, with sound. This process can take anywhere from one day at best to four or five days, and in some Broadway shows that are very heavy technical shows, they can take two weeks of tech rehearsals. They're very much stop and go, because the lighting designer has come in and sort of set some ideas for lights, but very often the process of the tech uh, rehearsal is the director saying, hold, stop, and going over and talking to the lighting designer and saying, oh, you know, I think, I think we need more light on her, and can you change the color a little bit, and can you up the intensity so I can see her face a little bit more very stop and go, uh, and it's a very laborious and challenging process, and for the actors it is painful because nobody cares about you during this process. Nobody's giving you acting notes during tech rehearsals. All they care about is hold still, don't move because we're shining a light on you and we want to see what the best look for it is. Great, we're good, we're moving on, great, continue. Or sometimes the stage manager will say, great, we don't have any cues for the next two pages, so stop. Let's jump to page 36 uh, where, where Dorothy re-enters and says, how have you been? Take it from there. And so the actors just need to sort of be on their toes and ready to jump around and ready to stop and wait for a few minutes and pick up. And That's tech rehearsal. It's laborious but it's so exciting when it all comes together. And the next phase is the dress rehearsal process where we then add costumes onto it. Now you may wonder why not just add costumes in tech? Simple reason is because it's too much to focus on. We wanna be able to add layer one layer at a time. So we move from rehearsing in a studio or a rehearsal space to rehearsing on stage tech rehearsals, we add lights and sound, and then finally we have dress rehearsals where we add costumes. 
And the next thing, which we don't always have the luxury of doing in a college or university setting, but in a professional theater, the next step would be what we call previews, which is where we add audience. This is also a really important part of the process for a director because I'm sitting now and not only watching the show that I staged, but I'm also watching the audience to see how they react. Are the jokes landing? Do we need to readjust anything? So usually a play might have anywhere from two uh, performances in previews, anywhere up to maybe even on a Broadway show, two weeks of previews. And on Broadway, the preview period uh, specifically means that the show has not been reviewed by critics yet. So when a Broadway show is in previews, tickets are sold, an audience can come in and watch the show, the director and the, and the creative team sit in the back and watch it, and every night those actors are still in rehearsal, they're getting notes. Sometimes if it's a new play, they're getting new pages every night to go home and learn and then come in and stage new, new uh, lines, new dialogue, new songs, um, and the audience gets to see the show really before it's finished. And then we come to opening night. And opening night, as I said, is when the director relinquishes control. I want to tell you about one other aspect of directing, and I, I, I provocatively start this off by calling it the dreaded C word. Don't be gross, it's not that word. Concept. Concept is the dreaded C word. Now, why is concept the dreaded C word? Well, first let's parse this. There are two ways that the term concept is used for directors. The good word, or the good version of it, is core concept. Every play, every director must know what the core concept is. The other one, which we're going to come to in a moment, is high concept. But let's talk about core concept real quick. Core concept is the unifying theme of the play. So the director has to ask him or herself, what is the unifying theme and how can I communicate that clearly? So in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, in that example that I showed you earlier, that director, Debbie Allen, said the, the core concept of the play is mendacity and honesty versus lies. And so that was her core concept. That's what she really wanted to get at. That was the story she was telling. It doesn't affect the play at all. It doesn't take a different approach to it. It's putting Tennessee Williams' play on stage, knowing that that's the core concept. That's a good thing. Every director should know what is the core concept of the play. Then we get into this thing called high concept. And this is where the dreaded C word really, really uh, sort of becomes a thing. A high concept is when a director interprets the play differently than what was intended. Now, very often, this is usually meant to make some sort of a statement. The director's trying to show off and say, let me set Hamlet by William Shakespeare on the moon because I want to be different. I want to do it really interestingly. That's why I call it the dreaded C word because high concept can be very risky. You can lose the thread of the story and all of a sudden you're showing off yourself as a director as opposed to telling the story. However, high concept isn't always bad. And here are the conditions that I sort of place for high concept. If you read the script and you feel in your interpretation of the script, particularly in the time period that you're living in, that somehow this play makes a real statement about what's going on in the world now. You can choose to reframe or uh, relocate that play into a modern time or a different setting if you're not messing with the script. That makes sense. So the idea is, if the play really fits into this concept, I think it's perfectly fine to do if it makes a statement. If you've interpreted and understood the play and you've said, this is the story I, I wish to tell, that's fine. What happens, unfortunately, with so many directors is they start with concept. They start right in with, oh, I want to do this play, I want to do Othello, but I want to set it in the White House and make it about Donald and Melania Trump somehow. Well, great, that might work, but you should start with understanding what's the story of the play and saying, well, this is a play about betrayal, this is a play about jealousy. Ooh, that makes me think of this true life thing that's going on. I'm going to set the play in that time period in order to make that statement. I hope that makes sense to you. Small theater in Ohio wanted to hire me to direct the Fantastics. And they hired me with a specific caveat. They said, we don't want this to be your grandmother's Fantastics. We don't want this to look like every version of the Fantastics that's ever been done. Because this show normally looks pretty much the same. So they said, we need you to create a concept. 
And my first reaction was, oh, don't do that to me. Don't make me start from a, a concept. That's not how a director should work. And they said, well, if you want the job, we want you to present a concept to us. So I immediately, I went to the script and I started reading it. And, and I'm reading this story about romance in a time of despair. I'm reading this story about uh, love conquering difficulties. And for whatever reason, images of the Dust Bowl which is America, the American Midwest and South during the Great Depression, right? When farmers were looking for land and all the land dried up. Um, for some reason, images of the Dust Bowl kept coming into my head. And I don't know why, because I never really studied it. So then I went and watched uh, a documentary on the Dust Bowl. And I sat with my script of the Fantastics and I went, holy shit, this really works. This really makes sense. And so I came back to them and I said, I think if we set this during the Dust Bowl and we do this and this and this, I think this will really work for this story and we don't have to change a single word of the script. Well, take a look at the trailer. Uh, this was a trailer I cut together from our production of the Fantastics. You've actually seen a photograph from this production before when I talked about costume design and color. Um, here's what we came up with. Beyond that road lies a shining world. Beyond that road lies despair. Beyond that road lies a world that's gleaming. People who are scheming. Beauty. director of that theater who hired me to do that production wound up in a conversation with one of the writers who wrote the Fantastics, this legend in musical theater. And somehow they connected and communicated and my friend Edward who hired me told him about this high concept production of the Fantastics during the Dust Bowl and I thought, oh my god, he, he's going to sue us for changing his play, he's going to be so angry. And to my uh, flattery and amazement and surprise, the writer of The Fantastics told my colleague that he loved the idea of setting it in the Dust Bowl. Whew. The last thing I just want to mention, uh, as I said at the beginning of this, is that 
uh, theater, film, and television have slightly different uses for the director. And here's how I want you to think about it. Here's the easiest way to frame it. Theater is an actor's medium. What I mean by that is that the last communication to the audience comes directly from the actors, right? As I said to you, that show opens and my job is done. If the actors forget their lines, I can't change that. If the actors decide to make new choices and the stage manager doesn't police it, I can't do anything about that. So ultimately, I hope that the actors are telling the story the way I coached them to, but really, theater is an actor's medium, meaning the audience and the actors have the most direct conflict, uh, 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 conversation over the story. Film, I want you to think of as a director's medium, meaning, that at the end of the process of filming a movie, the actors all go home, and then for months, the director and the editor sit and cut it all together and make what ultimately gets shown to the audience. So in a way, I could make another actor look much better or much worse than they are if I'm the director, just based on how I cut the film. And to give you a, a clear example of that, uh, a couple of videos back when I was talking about absurdism, I walked outside with my camera and my audio equipment and I recorded myself doing a scene from Waiting for Godot. Now, hopefully, it looked more or less like I was playing two different characters who were actually in a room together and talking to each other, but you know, obviously, if I'm playing both roles, I can only do one at a time. The director controls the medium of film because the director at the end of the day can cut things together to look differently than, than they really were. And so film is really a director's medium. And the biggest work of a director in film is what we call post-production. It's what they do after the actors are gone. The third is television. And I want you to remember that television is a producer's medium, meaning on a series, I'm watching The Wire right now on HBO. If you've never watched The Wire, do yourself a favor while you're in quarantine. It is the greatest television series of all time, in my opinion and many people's opinion. I'm actually watching it for my third time. I just love it so much. The Wire, if you watch, uh, or, or any episodic TV, if you watch the credits and pay attention, almost every episode has a different person directing it. Now, a series might have a director who comes back recurringly, but there's a certain continuity to a television series, so you wouldn't probably notice if, if let's say, Friends or Law and Order or uh, The Witcher or whatever your favorite uh, TV series is, you probably won't notice inconsistencies because the director has changed. Why is that? Because television is a producer's medium. At the end of the day, the producers of television or the showrunners, those are the people who created the script and are, are overseeing it, those people have the real power. And a director is just sort of a tool that they will hire to bring in and say, here's the story we're telling, you're responsible for making sure that you cut this together and you get the actors together, but we want it to be consistent so that every episode looks like it's part of the same show. That's the producer's job. So that's really the distinction. But in terms of the preparation, in terms of the cap being captain of the ship, in terms of the buck stops here, the director really is a similar function through all the different media. I hope this is useful to you. I hope that, uh, that you learn some new stuff about this and I hope you understand uh, what a director does. And if any of you are interested in digging deeper or hearing more about it, then bring it up the next time we have a class discussion on Zoom. In the meantime, I wish you very well. I hope that you're managing. I hope that your other teachers aren't stressing you out too much or that this isn't stressing you out too much. And I will see you all for the next one. Bye-bye.